Hey, happy Friday. This week, Huawei finally announced their new mobile operating system to take on Android and iOS. Google's next chip got completely leaked and Qualcomm's next chip got announced and the company also got into a massive legal fight. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by Nebula. Okay, for the first story, we're starting with Huawei's brand new operating system. Earlier versions of their Harmony OS on phones were really just Android with a bunch of heavy modifications, but with Harmony OS Next, it's now actually all new. Huawei says that this version uses their fully self-developed Harmony kernel, and it doesn't run Android apps either. Developers will need to build native Harmony OS apps for the platform using the ArcTS programming language. Harmony OS Next is launching first on their flagship phones like the Pure S70 and some of their new MatePad tablets, and some versions are even expected to come to watches. We also expect a broad rollout to older Huawei phones later, but it's not expected to come to any non-Huawei devices. In other words, Huawei is going to have their own operating system, their own app ecosystem, their own chip, basically everything. They're going to be a completely vertically integrated company, just like Apple. That is a huge change. Data from Counterpoint showed that Huawei accounted for 15 to 17 percent market share in China for smartphones, and that they're even beating Apple in the world's largest smartphone market. Huawei also has the second highest ever selling price in China, after Apple of course, meaning that their user base is a pretty rich target audience, so if Huawei can update its whole portfolio, then app developers will have a really large incentive, at least in China, to adopt the platform. Huawei claims that they already have 15,000 native applications and services running on Harmony OS Next, which is way better than the 200 that I heard about last Last time, but obviously this is still far away from the billions of apps that Android and iOS have. Anyway, Huawei also claims that Harmony OS will be 30% smoother and will give devices an extra hour of battery life over the Android-based Harmony OS 4. They say that file sharing speeds will be much faster than even iOS, allowing for something like AirDrop to multiple devices at once. And somehow Huawei also claims that image quality will increase by 1.6x on their cameras. I mean, obviously companies love to claim a lot of things and don't forget that their chip technologies are basically behind by like four generations or something like that. But yeah, all of this is extremely impressive from a company that was supposed to be on the verge of death after all the sanctions. I'm also wondering if they'll ever be able to expand outside of China because they've lost almost all of their market share everywhere else. But either way, good job. Okay, for my second story of the week, Google's next big chip for the Pixel lineup got leaked in a really unprecedented way by Android Authority. We're talking about the upcoming Google Tensor G5 chip, codenamed Laguna, which is expected to power the Pixel 10 series, and here's what we've learned about it. Most importantly, Google has separated itself from Samsung and will be using TSMC's 3 nanometer class N3E process node. That is the same tech that Apple uses for their new A18 Pro, which means that the Google chip will likely be significantly more efficient than their predecessor. For the CPU, Camilla says they made, quote, more weird CPU decisions because they'll have one Cortex-X4 big core, five Cortex-A725s, and two other small cores. The Cortex-X4 will be two whole generations behind next year, so this is again hardly gonna be a bleeding edge chip. And similarly, the GPU is tipped to be a custom design from Imagine Technologies called the DXT whatever whatever, running at 1.1 gigahertz. And that's a really odd choice because this GPU has been seen before in mid-range MediaTek chips like the Dimensity 930 in devices like the Moto G Power 2023. So that's extremely not flagship once again, which is so weird. Why does Google not want a flagship chip in their flagship phones? Anyway, talking of flagship chips, my third story of the week will be all about Qualcomm's big week. First, the company revealed their new flagship smartphone processor called the 8 Elite, and this has not only a new naming scheme, but also the company's first custom-designed CPU cores in years. These are called Orion CPU cores, just like they are in their laptops, which means that they come from their Nuvia acquisition, but they claim these are actually a ground-up redesign specifically for mobile applications, so they're kind of second-generation Orion, if you will. We see huge jumps of 40 plus percent across the CPU, GPU, NPU, and power efficiency too, which is very nice indeed, and better yet, the first 8 Elite devices are basically launching very soon too. Honor, Asus, OnePlus, Oppo, and Xiaomi are all expected to launch their flagships in the coming weeks, and Qualcomm said that, quote, we are now offering eight years of software support as well as eight versions of Android support, which is pretty significant. So now that Qualcomm, MediaTek, and Apple have all released their new flagship chips, we can actually see how these compare. Apple still wins with the single core benchmarks, but just by a tiny bit. Qualcomm wins on multi-core, and MediaTek has taken a really big step up too. Meanwhile, in the GPU front, MediaTek and Qualcomm both seem to significantly outperform Apple. But to be honest, all three of these chips look excellent this year. 
but just as Qualcomm was starting to go on a victory parade, ARM decided to crash their party. According to Bloomberg, ARM plans to scrap Qualcomm's chip design license and has issued the company a 60-day notice of the cancellation of their so-called architectural license agreement, which would stop Qualcomm from selling potentially all of their chips. Pretty radical. Now, to explain this very briefly, ARM actually has a lower fee for companies like Nuvia, who take a little bit of ARM technology, but then actually design their own CPUs themselves, than they do to companies like Qualcomm, who in the past at least have taken the whole ARM CPU design and shipped that in their chips, for example. And since Qualcomm bought Nuvia, there's now a debate about which of these licenses should be paid for which of the chips, in essence. The court will hear them in December, but ARM is clearly trying to strong arm Qualcomm to pay more, lest they be banned until then. That said, Qualcomm is also ARM's biggest customer, so both companies actually have a lot to lose. Let's see how this goes, but I bet they reach a settlement pretty soon instead of mutually assured destruction. Okay, moving on to our release monitor, Samsung's Z Fold Special Edition flagship is here. In its thinner and lighter, it has a larger inner display and a much less narrow outer display, plus even a 200 megapixel camera. Nice, though no S Pad support, and sadly, it's still exclusive to Korea and China. And also this week, Books has announced the successor to the fan favorite Palma called the Palma 2. It is still a smartphone sized e reader, but it now runs a less ancient Android 13. It has a faster chip and a fingerprint reader for $280. Nice. And talking of nice, Oppo announced the Find X8 series, which comes with two pretty cool new innovations. First, there's Oppo Mag, which is the company's take on magnetic wireless charging that includes fast chargers that hilariously even come with a fan built in. And second, some of the models include two different periscope camera lenses, with one of them even having a triple prism design that takes up less space, so they somehow even managed to shrink down their camera ring instead of increasing it. Wild. Okay, moving on, Honor announced their new Magic OS 9, which in China at least comes with two really interesting features. First, it has an AI deepfake detector that tells you if a video that you're looking at has been doctored. And second, you can tell the Honor AI assistant that, for example, you want to buy some tea and it will open an app, it will click through that app, and then it will place an order for you. If you remember, this is exactly what Rabbit said that their large action model would do, except now apparently it's working, at least in China. I would be surprised if Honor was able to bring that to the West and if people here would be okay with them screen recording and analyzing all the content on their screen and clicking through their apps, but okay. And for our last new release, Timex has shown off a new digital ring watch. It actually tells the time and I can't explain why, but I just really immediately love this. Okay, and as for the brief, we start with TSMC, who reportedly cut off a client after discovering that its chips were being sent to Huawei. They said that the chip was likely the Ascend 910B, used in Huawei's AI Accelerator, which is of course extremely against the US blacklists. It's unclear if TSMC got caught red-handed or if they were duped into building this chip that they were not supposed to build, but either would be pretty wild. And in more proof of corporate greed, telecom companies, home security companies, and internet advertisers are suing the FTC to stop their click to unsubscribe law because of course they are, they're terrible companies. And moving on, San Francisco will pay $212 million to end their reliance on five and a quarter inch floppy disks as they're moving their systems to something more modern. That follows Japan's expensive quest to get rid of floppy disks and also the quest of the German Navy who's apparently still relying to this day on eight inch floppy disks and is still looking for a replacement. Well, anyway, in fun news, Apple teased a week of Mac announcements starting on Monday, which would mean M4 equipped MacBook Pros and who knows what else. And another fun story this week is that an NFL player got caught using an illegal stream to watch his own team play. People on social media noticed the URL that gave him away and apparently accessing legal NFL streams is quote, a fiendish logistics puzzle, one that doesn't even have a just pay for it shortcut. As somebody who's part of a paid streaming platform, I do get the pain, but we just introduced a solution to some of these exclusive content problems a couple of days ago. We call our solution guest passes and they allow any Nebula subscriber to share access with a friend for a whole week. The friend doesn't even need a credit card to sign up or anything. Nebula subscriptions pay our bills and help us make better content for you, but we also know that paywalls can be annoying and we hope that this makes them less annoying. Nebula, of course, is our very own independent video streaming platform that specializes in thoughtful content from the internet's best educational creators. This includes our regular content, often early access. It includes bonus clips, like I usually do an extra Q&A session after each video. And it also includes high budget Nebula originals like Wendover's Jetlag series, Real History's Red Atom series, or my very own Technorama series. And of course, all of that with no ads and no annoying tracking. 
Signing up really helps to support our work. And if you use my link, gold.nebula.tv slash TFC, which is also linked down in the description, you will even get a 40% discount. My link brings the cost down to just $3 a month or $36 a year. I think they're super fair, but if you absolutely hate ongoing subscriptions, you can instead also opt for a lifetime membership. So check it out. Be sure to use my link in the description and I'll see you next Friday.